Welcome, everybody. It is the closing session. I think you have had a very intensive day. You have had presentations on 25 individual projects and uh, presumably have been able to engage with those uh, project developers, you know, on, on how that has been set up and how it's working. Um, and that uh, the whole purpose of today is, of course, to indeed inspire you so that you all go back home and kind of get new ideas for further, further development and further implementation. Now, uh, it is very, very encouraging to see that more and more municipalities, uh, businesses in that context also are implementing sustainable energy and adaptation measures. Um, and it is also becoming more and more recognized that it is uh, not only uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which is of course great and increasing resilience, but it's actually also delivering many other co-benefits such as improved uh, health, for citizens and, and sometimes also increased revenues, mainly from uh, avoided costs also. So our experience in Europe uh, is actually very, very good. We have been able over the past decades to show that it's not an opposition between economic growth and uh, fighting climate change. We have been able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions already by 23% since 1990. And we have at the same time uh, increased our GDP by over 50%. So that is, of course, a very, very good decoupling that we have there. Now, uh, the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy um, is obviously needed if we want to get into a sustainable development of our society in Europe uh, in the long term. Now, as you have been discussing and as we've all seen, there are already many technologies and measures that exist to help cities in their energy transition and also to, uh, to get ready to, to adapt to the impacts of climate change that we already see today. But the key, and I think we come back to this uh, time and time again, is the financing. How do we finance those uh, plans? Now the Commission uh, has also tried to be helpful and has been setting up many different instruments. I think you have already come across many of those from the opening session throughout the day. But let me just mention also two specific ones, one being uh, Urbis, which is the dedicated urban investment and advisory platform where you have tailor-made technical and financial advice uh, provided to urban authorities to really help them uh, develop their projects. And this is hand in hand with the European Investment Bank. And the other very interesting development that we have finally, I would say, pulled off is that Eurostat has been clarifying its approach to uh, the accounting rules applied to the treatment of energy performance contracts. This was an issue for a long time and we're very happy that it has now been clarified by Eurostat that you know, if you make investments in uh, public assets and improving the energy efficiency, this will not be counted on your deficit side of the, of the public um, budget. So that will certainly help uh, public authorities to, to go into this. Now let me just mention that when it comes to adaptation, uh, you may know that we have a European adaptation strategy that was adopted in 2013. We're currently evaluating uh, the state of implementation and the effectiveness of this strategy. There is a public consultation ongoing, as it is supposed to be the case for any evaluation. And this public consultation runs until the 1st of March, so we are all warmly invited to still uh, look into that and because it provides you with an opportunity to tell us how we could actually be of more help or more targeted help to help cities and, and businesses uh, get involved and become effective in this adaptation challenge. But again, as I said before, it is also very obvious that apart from any strategies, uh, measures, what have you, platforms, that it's still all about you know, how to activate private finance uh, for realizing the projects on for the many, many cities that we already have as members of the Covenant of Mayors. And of course, we hope to be attracting ever more members. Um, the financial institutions that we have in Europe have to clearly also in this respect increase their contribution to the investment that we need in order to get to this low carbon society. Uh, increased spending on, on climate measures, as we call them, but on the other hand, also basically redirecting uh, funds from unsustainable activities. And I think we can all think of certain things where there may well be public budget money fun uh, going into certain things that are not going to be beneficial for the transition to, to a low carbon economy. And that will also really need to be revisited and redirected. Now, that is also captured in the vision of the Paris Agreement, which says that you know, we need to make the finance flows 
consistent with a pathway towards low emission and climate resilient development. And that is what we want to be discussing in this panel, um, really how to best activate private finance for this particular objective. Now that brings me to the introduction of the panel and uh, the distinguished guests I have next to me. On uh, my right hand side I have Mr. Brian Cassidy, the program manager for improving the energy efficiency of Cork City social housing stock. Uh, and it's very interesting that Cork has, uh, of course, signed up to the targets for 2030 of uh, the Commandant of Mayors and is indeed really uh, pioneering when it comes to uh, energy efficiency in the housing stock. And I hope to hear more about that. Then to the further right, we have Peter Sweetman and uh, he is the Chief Executive of Climate Strategy and Partners, a consulting group in clean and efficient energy and climate change strategies. But also today he's here as uh, the Rapporteur of the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, EFIG, also known as that. This has been already established a few years ago in 2013 uh, by the European Commission together with the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative. Um, and EFIG, I think, has been very, uh, you know, successful in, in setting up an open dialogue and, again, platform to have this, this discussion between public and private financial institutions together with industry representatives and sector experts to really propose improvements uh, when it comes to policy and market solutions so that we can uh, unlock this long-term financing for energy efficiency. So there again, we hope to hear from you. On my left-hand side, Mr. Dave Pearson, who is the Vice President of the European Heat Pump Association. I think that does speak to a large extent for itself in terms of uh, you know, new and clean technologies in the heating sector. And then on the far left, uh, Mr. Brian Kilkelly, and he is the development lead of the Urban Transitions Team at the Climate Kick, the Knowledge and Information Center. And that, as it happens, is the largest EU public-private partnership, um, which aims at building a low carbon and climate resilient economy through innovation. So there again, I think we will be hearing some very interesting uh, insights from, from you as well. Now, the panel will be constructed, and this will be our common challenge to keep to the time, as always. Um, we will do a general question to all panelists first, and after that I will put a specific question uh, to each of the panelists, but each of these answers are supposed to be made in three minutes. So, uh, the general question is the following. From your specific experience, what are the main challenges for cities or citizens to invest in clean energy and climate adaptation measures. So the challenges that in your experience you have come across which, which kind of, I don't want to say impede, but which make it more difficult or, or you know, uh, are not sufficiently enabling the investments in clean energy and climate adaptation. Maybe, where shall I start? Maybe we start with you, Brian? Yep. Three minutes. Oh my gosh, it's quite a challenge, isn't it? Three minutes. Yeah. Okay, I'll try not to speak too fast. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's del del delightful to be here, and it's been a fantastic day uh, participating in the sessions and hearing all the great um, case studies and information from everybody about the, all the work that's going on to, uh, to tackle uh, this challenge and this opportunity we have. So yes, Climate Kick is the EU's main innovation agency. Uh, we've been going for about seven years. Uh, we work with 250 partners across Europe. Uh, we've launched about 900 startups, uh, educated 1,000, professionals uh, and leveraged about 2.5 billion of investment um, through the uh, funding that uh, we've been administering on behalf of the EU. Uh, and you know, our, our experience is that um, uh, there's a lot of great innovation out there, lots of great ideas. Um, so, uh, and we've been supporting lots of, lots of brilliant things. Um, but we, we, as we all know, we have quite a challenge. Um, so uh, we need to be reducing emissions by a further 20% by 2020 by 40% by 2030, and unfortunately, we're not quite on track. Um, we are making good progress, but, but we're not on track. Um, how many here have watched Star Wars movies? Okay, so you'll remember the last Star Wars movie, uh, one of the key things that was said is that we need to have hope. Uh, and I think for all of us, you know, in this, ch in this great adventure we're on, challenge we're trying to face with is that we do need to have hope. Uh, and the hope is that the innovation will help us to close this gap because there is an enormous gap between where we need to get to and where we are today. Uh, and as an agency, we're, uh, we're building that hope, I hope. Um, and uh, and the, ch the challenge we see is that you know, the, the innovation is often lagging in terms of implementation. 
For example, low carbon concrete was invented 10 years ago, but it's hardly used still today. Uh, and there's, there's scores of innovations we can talk about. Heat pumps, which uh, uh, my colleague Peter, you know, will 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 talk about later on. You know, been around for years, but you know, we're not getting these things out at scale. So that's one of the challenges, I think, in terms of you know how do how do we get these things moving faster? Um, and what we're trying to do as climate kicks, we're looking for what are the instruments, what are the kind of mechanisms we can use to stimulate um, scale. Uh, and a couple of things just to highlight. Uh, one is a climathon which is a kind of a 24-hour hackathon. We've been running uh, for about three years now, once a year. Uh, started with 20 cities, now up to 100 cities around the world. Um, and it's really about connecting the kind of city's ambitions for climate action with citizens. So it's providing a kind of a mechanism for connecting between citizens and, and mayors uh, and leaders. And I think that's, that's a key thing we need to do more of. We need to connect with citizens. Uh, we need to build understanding, knowledge, and that hope. A second uh, program which we kicked off last year in collaboration with C40, uh, which is around um, a program called Reinventing Cities, which is to say that cities have assets, they have land they own, which is perhaps not being used currently. How could that land be trans, trans, transformed into something that can be really a beacon for sustainability? So again, that's another program which can help stimulate uh, the ambition of mayors. And I can hear the timer going, so I think I better stop. Exactly. Thank I'm you. Struggling with my iPhone, but it's great. You know, maybe I keep that one. <laughs> I wasn't meant to be so brutal, but yeah, thanks a lot. So indeed, uh, from hope to scale to uh, getting getting citizens as much as possible involved, I think that is already a very good start. Then over to you, Dave. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, a compliment to everybody involved in the in the conference. It's been it's been great. Uh, but a long time ago, in a land far, far away, uh, 1978, Star Wars was the first movie I ever saw. So I, I would say I was influenced certainly. But more recently, 2008, a long time ago, in a land far, far away in Scotland, I was challenged uh, to come up with uh, how a, a, an industrial refrigeration business would evolve and and what to do. And we picked up on this sustainability thing. We listened to the leaders and we didn't just listen to what we have to do in the next five years or 10 years. We listened to the end goal. So 2040 or 2050, we have to pretty much decarbonize society because we had a problem with climate change and it was recognized the reason was too much greenhouse gas, particularly carbon dioxide. And more recently, we've recognized a secondary challenge, which is the air quality that we have. So Looking at this and thinking about heating and thinking about heat pumps, we realize that fundamentally the problem is that we're burning too much stuff, whether it's uh, gas or whether it's biomass or whether it's uh, energy from waste, none of them are as clean as what we need to be in 2050. So the challenge was, was very clear to us. So we set about trying to do heat pumps that were better than the heat pumps that were available because I realized fairly quickly that uh, if anybody's heard of a heat pump, they've probably heard that it doesn't work and it's, it's fundamentally not the case. So we built a heat pump that was able to do 90 degrees. It heats a city from the fjord in Norway, and that reduced their, their carbon dioxide emissions by 80%, and it reduced their NOx emissions by 100% locally. So what do we need to do more of? Well, fundamentally, we need to drive the customer base towards this, because at the moment, gas is really cheap, and it's still absolutely an option. So I liken it to trying to get my kids to have breakfast in the morning. It's a case of eat your cereal, but I'm going to put Smarties all over the table, and then I'm surprised when the children want to eat uh, the candy rather than the, the breakfast cereal. That's effectively what we're doing at the moment, which is to let uh, the kids eat sweets for breakfast. We know what the problem is. So we have to absolutely directly take, take issue with uh, moving forward from what the problem is into a variety of different solutions, but fundamentally, we know what the problem is. So how, how are we best going to do that? Well, it's either going to be by prohibition, which is effectively what we saw in Denmark over uh, 30 years ago, or it's going to be by taxation. We have to make gas more expensive or people will keep burning it. If we're going to keep it cheap, then we have to stop them from burning it. This hotel, for example, probably has a gas boiler. Most of the European Commission buildings probably have gas as the main heat source. So it's fundamentally the problem that we know what the issue is, but we're still letting people do it. And you wouldn't let your children away with it. So we have to all grow up a little bit. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. I mean, that's, uh, of course, something that has been out there for a long time already, making the cost of carbon, uh, you know, bite a little bit more. And we have been uh, having an agreement on the reform of the emissions trading system. So the price of CO2 has been going up. We're almost at 10 euros now. But it's true that, you know, we need to, we need to uh, keep this in mind about the different incentives 
and the moving uh, away from fossil fuel subsidies will be another important uh, discussion that will stay with us. Good, then we can uh, maybe move to Brian. Your views on what are the challenges? Uh, thank you, Yvonne. And uh, Dave, is that right? The cost of fossil fuels is a big problem when you're trying to uh, introduce uh, energy efficiency saving measures in two houses, uh, which is where I work. Uh, just a little bit about Cork. Cork is a city not as far west as Almada, if Katrina is there, so she can hold on to that title. Um, and uh, most of the energy is supplied through private, con private companies operating on a national basis using coal, gas and oil. Um, most of the houses in Cork City, both private and public, are heated by uh, natural gas. But we also still have a sizable element of, of oil and a smaller element of houses heated by coal. Um, for as long as I can remember, and I went to council 20 years, um, Cork City has been involved in energy efficiency improve, improvement measures for as long as I have been there, and including measures for greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, in the recent past, uh, in terms of its public buildings, it has con invested considerably in LED lighting, and in uh, both in the streetscape and in public buildings, and these are being paid for through uh, a pay-as-you-save scheme. The city is also a social housing provider with 9,000 social houses. In the last four years, 25 million has been, or the last five years, 25 million has been invested in energy efficiency improvement works uh, in the social housing in the city. Um, so that started off with a program of attic and cavity wall installation because we decided we would take an incremental approach as distinct from uh, a deep energy retrofit approach straight away as we felt that would spread the benefits uh, wider across the city and particularly among the social housing network where most of our tenants would be considered to be in, in fuel poverty. Um, so all our, all our eligible properties have now received attic and cavity wall installation. Uh, at the moment our stats show that we have uh, over 600 properties that would be rated as B3 or above under the energy rating scheme. Um, and Dave would be delighted to hear this, over 400 of our houses now have heat pumps. So we're, we're moving up on that scale as well. We're going to support the industry as best we can. Um, in terms of our national regulations, all new properties will, be, will have to have a minimum of the NZ standard or the, or the A3 standard which is the same. So what are our challenges for in terms of investing in this industry? Um, cheap fossil fuels, as I mentioned earlier, is the biggest challenge, and it is like the Smarties and, and the cereal, you know? A bit more Cocoa Pops, because as everybody knows, the children love Cocoa Pops, no matter what good breakfast cereal or breakfast product you put out there. Porridge is out the backyard for the, the elder people, but Cocoa Pops and similar products are, are what they like. Um, personal debt is an issue. People who would like to improve have high personal debt. Uh, it's, it's, we're coming out of the Great Recession, for what we would probably call it, that started in 2008. But there's still a high level of personal debt, so people who have properties are reluctant to invest until they get that uh, debt down. There's also a personal awareness factor, um, partly caused by confusion. Am I saving money or am I, am I improving my house? Personally, I like to think I'm improving the house. I'm not necessarily saving money. It's an added benefit, but it's not the main, main rationale. And th sometimes that emphasis on savings can, in, m in my own personal view, act as a barrier to the actual investment. You don't invest, uh, if you were building on a garage to your house, you do it because it benefits you as you view the world. You don't do it because you're saving money. Similarly, people who do house extensions or do other improvements to their houses, they're not saving, saving money, as, as Paul Kenny alluded earlier. They're investing in their house. They know that it not only do they get the comfort value, but if they should need to sell or want to sell their house later, its market value has increased. And we should bear in mind, we have been here before. And this, this is another iteration of the home improvement sector that began over 100 years ago with running water, electricity, sewage, heating, and now energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Home comfort is indeed a very important one. I think that's true, but we try to use any argument and the savings, of course, we'll keep in our toolbox to also mention. Peter, from your perspective, the challenges. Thank you. Um, so uh, I recognize this is the last session, so uh, I'll be as brief as I can in the three minutes provided. So I'm very happy that um, 424 people have come to a marketplace 
because in finance terms, we love the idea of supply and demand. And I think that clearly cities demand two thirds of global energy. They produce 70% of greenhouse gases. And of the 70%, about 40% come from buildings. So um, where I see the opportunities is cities have uh, a direct energy use. And uh, I happen to chair a business that helps cities fund the replacement of lighting systems, for example. In countries, I'll take Spain as an example, because it's where we're based, only 10% of, of the public street lighting systems have been changed for LEDs, and typically, LED lighting systems can save 80% of the, of the value of the energy cost, in, in other words. And they can provide lots of fun gadgets and technologies so that the city hall can be aware of the maintenance issues, it can reduce maintenance costs, it can make these systems more um, easily managed, and so on. So there's a really so on the one side, direct energy use can be addressed immediately and it can be done through a plethora of financial instruments which are currently available, supported by both public and private sector organizations. Then the role of cities is how do cities facilitate, and the way I sort of describe this is help to renovation. How can a city facilitate that its citizens have a right to a comfortable, warm, dignified home, for example? And I think that that is an opportunity where this is um, something, this has got to do with planning. It's got to do with the availability of the right skilled resources to upgrade homes. It's got to do with the right timing of the provision of financing offers. So for example, it's no good offering financing to somebody not planning to change their home. You've got to offer the right financing solution at the time where somebody's planning to do something to their home. Now, if they're planning to, to, to install a new kitchen, then perhaps the, provi the provider of those funds could ask at that point in time whether there was an energy efficiency upgrade that could also be achieved, and whether that financial institution would consider the increase in the value of the property, which you've just remarked upon, um, as being something that they could lend against or lend more against so that the, so that the individual or the, or the family can invest in those energy efficiency measures. So I think there are a number of things in terms of, again, there are, there are a number of areas where we can improve. And I, I do exhort, I think that as cities, and I look through the, the, the list of the people who've attended, a lot of you coming from local authorities and from city uh, um, uh, halls, I do think that you can perhaps more actively just go out there, you know where the bank branches are in your towns and cities, just go out, collect them together, bring them into an, bring them into an environment where you can have an open discussion. EFIG, the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, did, had technical discussions, so we can discuss heat pumps, we can discuss financial instruments, in an environment which allows policymakers, financial institutions, and energy efficiency market stakeholders to really come together and talk freely. So, you know, I think you need to create, because this is relatively technical, you need different actors to be coordinated. Those actors aren't naturally coordinated, they're not. And so what we need to do is find more forums where, convened by cities, for example, who want to deliver greenhouse gas savings, they want to deliver more productive environments, they want to comply with their, their uh, commitments. I mean, I noticed New York's got an energy efficiency target, or is about to have one. You know, there's, you know, you can enforce local standards and so on, on the one hand, but on the other hand, collect together, and I, and I also like the French example that was mentioned in a couple of the side meetings here, where, again, the financing solutions and the technical solutions and the local industries that are delivering those products are being brought together by the cities and local authorities to together work out the solutions that work for them. Now, there's no one-size-fits-all, and that's part of the problem, but there is all the components are the same, and these meetings can be productive in the development of the financing solutions that match the physical solutions. So that would be my recommendation. Very good. You've gone well beyond the challenge in, in starting to talk about the solutions, which is, of course, why we're here. So thanks a lot for that. And I think we'll be trying to drill down a little bit. You have already outlined your experience and you know, also giving some insights as to where you think we should be heading. But we will drill down on this. And my first question is to you, Brian, on my right-hand side, Brian Cassidy, because I now realize we have two Brians. Um, Brian, from your experience in, in Cork, do you believe the financing industry offers sufficiently targeted products to help cities invest in clean energy and climate adaptation? 
maybe also the adaptation angle. I don't know what you're experiencing, Cork, is with that. Maybe it's a bit, you know, you have more experience in the energy efficiency side, but it's a bit about, you know, is the, the, the financing industry really into this? Have they come up with, you know, the products that are needed to also make it feasible when you have managed to convince the people? You know, is, is there something for them? Over to you and you have Thank you, Yvonne. Again. Um, initially, I was going to say yes and no. After today, I was going to say yes and maybe. Um, there's no doubt um, at a high level and at an international level, the banking industry is interested. And I've heard two talks at home in the last uh, two weeks where banking people uh, have been talking about billions and trillions swirling around on the international markets looking for a home and that the energy efficiency retrofitting and improvement industry is one of them. However, in my own city, I'm not aware of any bank that has advertised energy retrofitting loans uh, as part of its stock of sale. Uh, even for deposits, they're not looking to take in deposits for that purpose. Um, and the reason for that is the banking industry at the moment, I would say, doesn't see energy efficiency improvement works as a separate market, and therefore doesn't target loans at that market. At best, it would see it as part of the home improvement market, which as I alluded to earlier, it's another step on the development of the home. Um, I, I also believe that because of this emphasis on the savings, and we keep coming back to savings, that if you go into a bank with a deep retrofit, they'll tell you that, that you know the savings are going to take you so long I won't give you the loan. So there needs to be a change of emphasis on to the improvement side of the house as you would for any other improvement. Um, and certainly, home improvements is something the banks have a tailored product for. They also have tailored products for buying a car and going on holidays. So, you know, putting another one in there for energy efficiency shouldn't be too difficult. Um, and the whole scheme, in terms of, should be about affordability and just for the affordability, nothing else. Can the customer afford to borrow the money? That's it. Shouldn't be any more complicated than that. Um, there was a problem today, today about the scale being offered by a bank. Well. I'm sure 100 years ago, people in the banks and the car industry sat here and said, the, the car industry said, we'd need billions, but the people buying our cars, they only need whatever it was at the time, say the equivalent of 20,000 today. It's not too different to the situation we're in now. So there shouldn't be a problem. And as I said already, they're already lending for cars, holidays, and other uh, products. To me, it would be a sign of great progress if I saw on the bank's website or I saw in my local branch, uh, by the way, Banks don't like people coming into their premises anymore. They're not that impressed with it. Um, you're only a, a burden to them. But wouldn't it be great if they had a financial package on their website or a little slip of paper along with the car loan, the holiday loan, and the home improvement loan that said, here's a loan for to improve your business, the energy efficiency of your business or your home. Again, I said, it shouldn't be that difficult. And the great thing for the banks was, would be, if, if you're an early adapter, it would be part of your corporate social responsibility portfolio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And also in particular to even staying below the three minutes. Very good. No, but I think it's an interesting experience. Um, and, and indeed, in, although Cork has so well advanced already on the, in the area of energy efficiency, you're still saying this is in a way, despite the banks not really uh, having this uh, in an attractive offer for citizens. So that's something to take away. Um, my next question is actually to Dave on my left-hand side. Um, you have, of course, in the Heat Pump Association, uh, you're, you're quite well placed to say that, you know, many technical solutions are already on the market and they are also, if you look into it, already, you know, viable investments, both for cities and citizens themselves. But um, how can the uptake of these technical solutions be further stimulated? You already mentioned the, the fossil fuel price in a way, the gas price, but I mean, uh, you also said we need to bring this to, to the citizens. So how, wh how do you see that? How could we enhance the uptake? So I'll take 90 seconds on two different parts. Um, the domestic heat pump area to me is, is fairly simple, that we now have uh, technologies that are capable of fitting most of the domestic properties, but most of these domestic properties every month get a, a bill from their gas supplier. It seems to me that we have to replicate what we did with the uh, renewable electricity market, particularly with uh, the obligation to generate uh, renewable electricity and we have to obligate the supplier of gas to also offer uh, a, a renewable heat solution. I believe this is already done in Austria so that we're we're basically pushing the, the, the purveyors of the wrong stuff to actually offer the right stuff. So that's what I do domestically. 
in the industrial market, uh, you know, the, the challenge in cities is absolutely where we are focused because it's the largest part of the energy consumption. It's also the hardest bit to do, and we like, we like the challenge. And you couldn't fit individual heat pumps in every single building of, of a large city for a variety of reasons. So we recognize district heating as a solution for the cities, and therefore the district heating has to get its heat from somewhere, and that's why we focus on the rivers. So in, in Cork, for example, there will be more than ample heat in the water to supply heat for district heating uh, to all the buildings. So in terms of wh why that would be fundable, and it's a bit like sitting in this room, if, if this was the river down here and we decided to have a heat pump, I could only get the financiers, who are fairly simple people, and I don't mean that in any sort of uh, uh, slant, but they will lend you more money than you, you possibly want, provided you promise to give it back to them and give them back more than they actually gave you. So it's a very simple relationship, but they will only lend you money if you can give it back to them, and you can only give it back to them if you actually set up a business that actually sells. So if I want to sell heat to every single row in this room, then somebody either has to make that financially uh, an absolute no-brainer, which is going to be very difficult, as we said, or we have to have the cities, and this is where the covenant of mayors come in, we have to have them saying, look, we take responsibility as the, the adults of the house to say, this is the problem that's going on in our house. It is burning gas in the cities. It's apparently 40% of the NOx emissions in London is from burning gas, not from transport or taxis or red buses. It's from burning gas for heating. We have to say to the buildings, you're going to have to do better because uh, e effectively we're allowing people to, to pollute our environment absolutely unchecked. So we have to bring a little bit of a mum and dad strong arm to the whole situation and really get all the buildings to, to, uh, to, to do something which frankly, Whenever we speak to industrial customers, your food factories, and we say, here's an energy efficiency um, opportunity, they'll say, well, can I get my money back in less than, less than three years? It's not what businesses do. These are not long, these are not short-term plays. They are likely to be 10-year investments. They're going to take some time. And so we have to really set up the situation where the customers will come and therefore the finance will come and therefore the projects can get built and we can do lower carbon, lower NOx, we can create jobs, we can stop exporting our cash down the gas pipe, because um, that's effectively what the European Union is doing. It's a billion euros a day of gas imports. So we can draw all these things together for the benefit of society, but we just, we just need to uh, grow up a little bit, I think. Thank you very much for that interesting, I think if we put you on, on national TV, you know, the pitch would be very, very good. Um, I move back to my right, Peter. Um, your views, in principle, I think we hear today, and, and it is also fairly common sense, you know, energy efficiency already, you know, makes sense, both from a, from a savings perspective, cost-wise, uh, greenhouse gas emission-wise, etc. But still, we see that there are very few private investors interested even in this area. Um, you know, they're rarely also a real important component of any urban program. So our question is a little bit, you know, why is this and, and what can we do to encourage more private investments? Thank you. Um, so first of all, to, to, to frame my answer, um, I popped out th th this morning and, and was able to listen to the sustainable finance discussion in the European Parliament. Why is that interesting? Well, that was interesting because the high-level energy, uh, high-level expert group on sustainable finance produced a, a report, and in that report, it stated that investors' combined exposure to carbon-intensive sectors is roughly 45 percent, and less than one percent of global institutional investors are green infrastructure assets. I also note that green bonds are less than 0.2 percent of the global capital markets. So uh, I, I come at this by saying, "Ha." Huh, how could it be that financial institutions have such high levels of exposure to the wrong side of this transition? And how is it that in Cork, they offer car loans and uh, holiday loans and all kinds of loans, but they're not offering the kinds of loans that we need to get the buildings on the track that's necessary to deliver us a carbon-free um, economy in 2050? Hmm, that's a big issue. So I think, uh, so, First of all, it's not that the money's not there, so one thing I wanted to point out is that there's a great uh, piece of work done by the G20's Energy Efficiency Finance Task Group, which is called the Energy Efe Efficiency Investment Toolkit, and what it does is it maps $220 billion of integrated energy efficiency expenditure across the world, private and public sector. It has 120 private sector banks and $4 trillion of asset 
managers, all of them committing to do more energy efficiency investments. So again, it's not about the, the, the commitment. So why is this relevant to a bunch of people looking at cities? I think cities can do three things to help all that money get itself into the right opportunities. The first is legislate. Frankly, let's just enforce the standards on buildings. Let's make sure that standards are built to near, near zero energy because that is the building that will last. Let's not give people offices and homes that in 10 years' time, by force, will have to be renovated at expensive, expensive costs. Um, the, sec the second thing was let us establish targets and goals that can align our industries in our mission. If our city's mission is to have energy efficient buildings, let's just establish what they are, figure out a baseline that takes us to 2050, and then work to that, because I think people respond to a challenge. And the third thing, and the most important thing which I mentioned earlier, is let's assist our owners of buildings to have the right tools that are necessary to be able to deliver that. Let us not force that challenge down to the poor, stressed family owner who's got 101 things to do, including clear up the cocoa pops and, the, and, the spaghetti and, the, and, and all the other things that people are trying to eat for breakfast, and force them while they're at it to figure out how to renovate their home and how to fund that. All of those tasks added up to one another just is too much. I think that the private sector can, should play a greater role, and that, and that, that will happen through pressure, top-down pressure. In other words, no at, you know, no, you shouldn't have 45% of your balance sheet on non-transition assets. You should be in agreement with the Paris the, the par aligned with the Paris Agreement, and therefore you need to do more building renovation work. And as a result, products will come out, customers will be served, and we can deliver to our building stock in cities. Sounds good. I think we will come to the audience in a moment to hear, you know, how, how from the city's perspective uh, this is observed. And also uh, the last targeted question I move to, to Brian on my left hand side. It's a little bit uh, the same question in a way because it's all about, you know, and you have said you've been rolling out, you know, all kinds of specific projects um, where maybe you have formed a view how cities can attract this private investment in clean, in clean energy and climate adaptation. Does this match what Peter was just saying or you have a very different view? Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very similar view. And um, uh, I think Peter's absolutely right that we have, to be, we have to be mindful of what we're asking people to do, this kind of pressure down. Uh, and, and I think you know, my, my answer to this is that in our experience as Climate Cake, working with cities and working with the private sector and some of the leading universities in Europe and getting innovation to market, is that actually for cities, um, there just isn't enough people. You know, there just isn't enough of you, all you city folks out here, you know, who are working in this area. They're very stressed departments, and they're actually being more stressed and reduced. Uh, we're working with the city of Birmingham in the UK, and like in the last few months, virtually the whole of their sustainability department has just been closed down. Just because cuts, severe cuts, austerity, and across Europe, you know, the, the resources are incredibly squeezed. I mean, it's not universal, of course. Some cities are doing really well and have found ways to resource these things. But our experience is that, you know, we need to make systemic changes to cities. So we can't just make little changes here and there and a bit of efficiency here and a bit of efficiency there. We need to make major changes. You know, this requires different business models, different ways, different collaborations. So, Peter, your, your point about, um, you know, bring the banks in bring the energy efficiency companies in, create that forum. You're right, but who's gonna do that in the city? Who's got the skills to do it, the time to do it, the mandate to do it? So um, you're absolutely right, Th that would be incredibly helpful. Um, so I think you know, that's a real challenge we find is that you know, en engaging with these cities, and the cities also find it hard to hold on to some of their brightest people. Mm. And things are moving very fast, so it's a fast moving area, it's a, it's a challenging area. So I would say you know, we need to help cities find ways in which they can up the resources, um, participate in the uh, returns being generated, because for sure, as we've all agreed, there's money to be made here. Uh, and actually, the, you know, what we're looking at as Climate Kick is how can we recycle some of the investment that is created and the value that's created back into um, enabling that investment to happen again. So, you know, what we find is that, you know, we, we see some great projects, returns are made, very clear cut. If we can capture some of those returns, and there's a variety of financial mechanisms to do that, recycle that back into the resources, then we've got a chance of hitting these targets. So, um, you know, it's not technology we need. There's great technology out there, um, but we're not getting the technology to market fast enough. And the challenge is when you go and talk to the cities, 
it's hard to find the people to talk to understand this. And it's hard to get those, those people together. So we need, we need more people, is my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. I mean, uh, I, I was hoping and tempted to ask whether it's a difference when a city has signed up to the Covenant of Mayors and has actually made this commitment to, uh, to reach the 2030 targets and go beyond, because I presume that when a, a city, you know, council takes this commitment, that there would need to be the people to actually achieve this. But I don't know. I mean, and there, I was wondering whether Birmingham is a member of the <laughs> of the well, government of mayors. I mean, they, um, I don't know whether they are or not, but they, um, you know, very very committed um, city on the targets. But still, you know, they have to make some pretty tough decisions around, you know, where they they got budget on social care and health care and all these various things. Uh, sure. But I think it does make a difference, and I think you know the other. The other challenge cities have, um, the city leadership is, um, they maybe are prepared to take one or two risks in a year in terms of projects and taking sticking their ne sticking their neck out and saying we need to do this. Actually, cities need to make dozens of risky decisions, perceived risky decisions, a year as well. So that's another thing we need to help them with. Is we need to help them to be brave enough um, to uh, to make those 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 decisions, which are perceived as risk. Risky yeah, that's what I was going to say because actually, as I think we all agree on this stage, that you know it shouldn't be perceived as so risky, and and there is a very good common sense case to to be making these investments. Very good. Thank you so much for these interventions already. Let's take a few minutes because I do think we started a little bit late, so I hope we can take a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. Now we'll need to be uh, diligent also in that. So if I can see some hands of people who would like to ask a question, you would need to give us your name and organization and, and of course also, if possible, keep your questions short. Who would be interested to put some questions to the panelists? Maybe challenge them a little bit further. It all sounded like, you know, it should be easy. But if it was so easy, you know, we wouldn't be having this panel today. I don't see any hands. Yeah, very much at the back. Sir, you have the floor. Yeah, lady is coming. Thank you, uh, Andy Deacon from the City Network uh, Climate Alliance, uh, working with small and medium cities on both adaptation and mitigation. Um, a number of the panelists have, have kind of referred to the important role of cities and uh, the European Parliament's Constitutional Affairs Committee um, is starting to look at the role of cities in delivering on the Paris Agreement and kind of changing the way that European institutions, whether that's the budget committee, uh, thinking about future structural fund spending, the role of organizations like EuroCity, CMR, Climate Alliance, um, and others, to get more formal recognition of the important role of, of cities in helping to meet this agenda. Kind of what is panelists' view on that? And kind of where do we best formalize that role to deliver on our climate ambitions? Thank you. A very interesting question indeed. And then broadening it to indeed the role of, of cities and subnational uh, authorities in, in uh, having access to EU funding and of course other funding as well. Who would like to comment? I think it's a great question, and I think it's uh, it's great to hear that there's uh, the constitutional role of, of cities is, is being looked at. For me, it's very simple. Um, if we've got a collective target, then we break it down, and everybody has to achieve their collective individual part of it. So if uh, the Paris Agreement is 80% decarbonisation by 2050, then everybody in this room has to decarbonise by 80%. So the maths is very easy as well. So each city has to, to achieve that, and, and if they don't have a plan to achieve... 5% every year for the next 20, 30 years, then they're going to fail. So we should be, we should be picking out the people that are looking like the, the troublemakers, the ones that are going to fail now, because if they haven't achieved 5% in the last year, they're unlikely to achieve 5% next year or the year after, the year after that. And in reality, big projects take two or three years to get going. So basically, unless their target in three years' time is to have achieved about 20% saving, then they're they're not on the right path and we should spot that early. Going back to my innovation days, innovation is all about spotting the losers early and not spending money on them. So we need to spot, the, spot them uh, faster. Thank you very much for that uh, 
interesting and maybe even provocative reply because of course the constitutional role of cities I think was more in the sense of okay helping the cities uh, achieve their commitments but you're saying they should actually be obliged to do so so that's of course also an interesting uh, dimension there um, any other hands yeah Sorry, if I could just comment on that I, I think the EU through the cities can promote they can regulate and they can grant aid but I think the industry is so big and the commitment so large that the, you do need the banking sector and the private sector involved in a major way. Um, it, it is essential, it has to happen. It, as I said, this is part of an iteration we've been here before with water, with electricity, with heating. Um, this is just another iteration in the development of, of our homes and we should grasp it and grab it and, and make the most of it. You know, and if, if you look at why did we bring in sewage systems into our homes? Because it was pollution, the same, it's actually the same end result. So I think the EU, it's, it's regulatory and it's promotional and it's grant aiding through the various agencies. Can I, just on that theme, allow me to suggest that one of the things, one of the roles that cities can play is to promote new ways of thinking and new business models. So for example, cities want to guarantee mobility, for example. Citizens need to get from A to B. So let's just have mobility programs decarbonize, so we want to pr provide decarbonized mobility, which allows them to think about regulating Uber or public transport in the year 2050 and other interesting challenges which there's no answer to, but they're the kinds of things which stimulate innovation, for example, rather than just picking losers and saying no funding. We can say, sort of, how do I guarantee, and how do I guarantee, for example, healthy workplaces, and productive workplaces, right? That's a challenge, right? Are all my workplaces healthy and productive? Hmm, I don't know. You know, let's go look at the buildings, let's figure out. So it's, it's for me, it's, and, and then we think about, for example, heating as a service. Heating as a service, does that, will that enable heat pumps? For example, heating as a decarbonized service that needs to fit within my decarbonization commitment under the Paris Agreement, for example. So it's a case of, let's take these lofty ambitions and let's convert them into the language of cities and the language of citizens. You know, let's figure out the plans, and the point is about innovation, and the point is about business. I personally believe, and business draws finance, not the other way around, finance doesn't create business, business draws finance in. We want to create the new business models that will deliver the cities that we want, and then the business models will be funded. So, for example, if we want to fund low-carbon heat sources to buildings, that would be a great thing, and a city can determine how many, what buildings, which one's first and which one's second, rather than having a planning department that responds traditionally to traditional planning requests and then to, to fire the sustainability team because of cuts. So what we need is a mobility department that thinks newly about mobility and we need a build, we need an environment in buildings, indoor environment and buildings department. So in other words, I'm saying throw everything up in the air, see where it lands and figure out new ways to do things because otherwise with all the different pressures, I think we're not going to get very, very, very well fast. Thanks, Peter. I think that's an interesting uh, suggestion that certainly the people in the audience will be taking away. Uh, in view of the time, I will just uh, move on to our closing question uh, for the panelists again, where you will only have one minute to give us your views. But it is actually, I think, a very challenging question um, because it is all about, we've heard about, you know, the technology is there, the financial sector is starting to get engaged, we need more products, but I mean, we have been uh, working on that already for quite some time. We have platforms, we have funds, we have regulation and legislation pretty much already sealed by the European Parliament and, uh, and the Council. So, uh, in your view, and this is the question, what additional actions would be required at EU level? And this is really, I mean, I'm sorry, but we're, you know, the European Commission, so we're always looking at, okay, what can the EU provide in terms of additional uh, value and what action at EU level would be still useful to support cities and citizens in accelerating investment in clean energy and climate resilience. So, one minute, maybe. Brian, you want to start? Oh, it's a really tough question, uh, to be sure. Uh, I would. If you say nothing, we're there, you know, that's also okay. We first maybe need to see <laughs> where we're heading with the new Energy Performance in Buildings Directive. We do have obligations on heat suppliers with additional renewable per year, you know, so, I mean, maybe we need to first see now and implement this, but... Yeah, no, sorry. it's true. We, we are doing a lot. Um, what, are, what we hear from businesses is actually they would welcome even more regulation, which I found amazing to hear, literally from the private sector. And actually, for them, you know, it's, it's you know, clarity. Give us the target, set the even playing field, we'll compete around that, we, c we can do this. So I, I think businesses actually and are, are 
are more you know, are, are ready to be more ambitious. I don't know that the citizens are quite on that journey yet. So perhaps the EU needs to up its communication. You know, it's kind of the way it engages citizens on this journey. So there's something around communication uh, and inspiration that, that I would say that we, we need to do, put some more attention to. I know the EU is thinking more about behavior change and social innovation, and we, we applaud that. Our experience is that actually uh, there's more we can do in that area to change mindsets and perceptions. So, uh, and it's great that I think EU funding is starting to think about that and change that. So I would say go, go for that. Um, but you know, we, we need to be so much more ambitious. Uh, we just we just you know we need to go faster because we're you know we're we're not on target. Uh, we need to be more ambitious. Thanks, Brian. I think that is probably <laughs> that is definitely true. But I mean. Um, I think it's a very pertinent point about the communication and, and, and you know making this clear that we're on this journey together to the citizens so that we can actually increase this ambition because without that we'll not get there if the citizens are not convinced. Um, Dave, your views as to additional EU action. And again, I have to say the legislation has just been reviewed and has just been agreed, so I don't think we'll <laughs> get another chance at that anytime soon. Hmm. Okay, well, I, th I think there probably is a lot in the pipeline that's, that's coming along. Um, for, for me, um, you know, particularly in the UK, uh, we've, we've, we've had quite significant uh, carrots in terms of the renewable heat incentive, and it hasn't really moved the market for, for heat pumps. So uh, that came from the European legislation. I think what we, we need to see are more sticks. Um, I think at the moment, uh, we've got some very weak, um, you know, carbon legislation in, in that respect. But if I could change anything, it would probably be Adding, adding tambourines into this mix. So carrot sticks and tambourines, we need a little bit of uh, publicity. Has anybody from the European Commission stood up and said, within 20, 25, 30 years, we have to have phased down the use of fossil fuels? I don't think that really is the message that's out there because if it was, if it was, then uh, we, we would see people beginning to plan for that. And at the moment, it seems to me that business as usual is, is absolutely what the citizens are, are, are seeing from this. So I think um, a little bit of, uh, future gazing. We, the goal is good, the goal is well stated, there's a lot of policy, but I think breaking that policy down into these are the steps that we collectively as society will be taking over the next 20 years. So give us, give us a little bit of a, a story for the next 20, 30 years. Okay, uh, communication and the story and the tambourines, I think it is well put. I mean, we, it's not that we haven't been saying it, we have been saying it, but uh, fossil fuels f subsidies phase down is one of the big issues out there and of course we discuss this with member states uh, because it's not something that we set at EU level and we're doing our best with our increasing the carbon price. Uh, but yeah, the tambourines I think is a, is a nice one. Um, Brian, you want to? Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Um, I, I think it should be made less complicated. Um, at the moment when an energy efficiency of deep, or deep one particularly is undertaking, the level of technical expertise and knowledge and calculations and sums that are done is, is quite onerous for a homeowner, and there must be a way to make it less onerous. So if I want to externally insulate my wall, I shouldn't really be too worried about how many greenhouse gas reductions I'm running. That's a central statistics requirement, you know, that, that national governments, cent cities, national governments, and the EU want because they want to show how much they've reduced it. But for Joe Soap in the street trying to do um, an improvement to his home, it's, it's not really an issue what his greenhouse gas reductions is. Now, the other side of that is that because of this emphasis on savings, we're not really getting the message across, which is, and I think this is an EU responsibility, it's about greenhouse gas reductions and protecting our environment. And I, I think we need to get back to that in a major way that that's what we're at. That's what the end game is in, in, in this industry. And the others are all side benefits, the savings, the improvement quality of life, etc. cetera. They're, they're the side show. The main one is the greenhouse gas reductions. As I said, we did it in the past when we brought fresh water to the home, we brought electricity to the home, we brought sewage plants to the home. That was all based on environmental requirements and people didn't get lost in, in calculations such as the, the kilowatt hours of electricity that we're going to consume or the population equivalent for a sewage plant. So I think we need to get back and, and make, take steps to make this easy for the homeowner to do. Thank you. Uh, very interesting indeed because you've been doing it so I think learning some lessons there for what you have come across is very good. Peter? So first, first of all, of course, uh, Europe um, has genuinely a world-class package of legislation in the energy efficiency and uh, energy and buildings arena at the moment, um, which I uh, think delivers high um, 
the, some of the lowest some of the lowest energy intensity of um, many global uh, nations that are equivalent to Europe. So therefore, clearly there's something that's going right. The thing I think that the Commission could absolutely do is um, the high-level expert group on, fin on sustainable finance said that there is a gap of 130 billion euros every year, which is just for energy efficiency, just in buildings. So any of you in the audience hear the, hear the term green or sustainable finance, you should realize that 75% of those letters and those terms refers to energy efficiency in European buildings. So when the Commission writes an action plan, and when that action plan as a response to this very excellent report, which on page 59 mentions the group that I rapporteur, the EFIG uh, group, um, we need to think about how banks can be asked to identify which of their loans and assets are green and which are not green, right? I gave a, a statistic at the beginning of my remarks to give you a sense of what was green and what was not green. I'll also tell you that the European Central Bank at the moment, when it provides liquidity on mortgages and car loans, does not ask a single question to do with the sustainability or greenness of any of those assets. So why don't we just ask the question, which of these assets are green? Why don't we ask the financial institutions to tag, to give environmental um, assessments to the assets that they fund, and then we will be able to see with some visibility which are green and which are not green. And then I guarantee, as I sit here, that those local banks will be coming to the cities offering the products that you so desire. That's a good closure. <laughs> Indeed, and I think it's actually a very nice one because, as you know, in two weeks' time, the Commission will be making proposals and will be coming out with this action plan. So uh, we will echo this to our colleagues who are writing this plan as we speak. Of course, we're very busily working with them on this. Uh, and it's, I think it's indeed uh, an indication of all the different components that we need. We need a disclosure on the investment institution side. We need the technologies, obviously. But I, I also am quite attracted by this notion that we need to bring the story still more clearly, more simply, and in a more compelling way in the longer term perspective to, to all the citizens. And I'm, of course, extremely grateful for the members of the Covenant of Mayors in the cities because you're doing this. In practice, we have uh, Brian from Cork here, who is uh, testi testifying to that. So, um, yes, we're in all this together. It's a huge challenge, but I think it's a very inspiring and, and uh, optimistic outlook, and let's keep on working on that. So I would like to hereby thank all the panelists for sharing your experiences uh, on these challenges and also your, your suggestions for how we can uh, really in increase still uh, climate and clean energy investments. Uh, in cities, I would also like to thank all of you for still participating in this panel at the end of a very long day. We hope you have been inspired, that you take this away in order to further develop you know, successful projects in this area. Um, and let me remind you that if you want to come back to all the discussions we've been having, there will be uh, video recordings of the day and also the slides that have been shown in other sessions uh, online uh, on the website soon after, after today. Uh, and then uh, that just leaves me to invite you to the cocktail reception outside of this room and then hopefully for you to find your way to the buffet dinner also afterwards. Thank you so much and hope to see many of you again tomorrow in the uh, ceremony for the Convent of Mayors. Thank you so much to all of you.